Hey, I'm Nick Long Gamer. Welcome back to FM24 Youth Factory. This is episode number four. We're about to venture into yet another year in the Vanarama National South. We failed to get promoted for the first time since the very beginning of the series, but we finished well. We were close to promotion. Two of the three best teams have now been promoted, so I, I like our chances this season if we could hang on to players. Now it's only late June, we've got a long time to go yet, and I've been getting tons of offers for players already, and I've already got a couple upset players that I haven't accepted offers. That could wreak havoc on the start of our season as we try to use our minimum security to hang on to some of these players. I've already had to add one year to cheese the, the deals for guys who wanted to be let go. Just adding one year onto those. And only a couple. And I had only had to do that once before. So in all these seasons, it's only three contracts that I've had to extend. We also have one who was trying forcibly to leave on a free, signed with somebody else while he was refusing to sign with us, and we will be able to retain him. Somebody has to offer us more than a transfer value to get him. That's our minimum security. They've got to have a substantial offer. It doesn't have to be massive, it just has to be beyond their worth. Over time, we've certainly lost plenty of players. One player we have not lost yet, one player who is growing into his role, he came on as our backup fullback, both left and right fullback. Kamara has grown almost to be equivalent of both of our fullbacks now. He's, he's really come along uh, in his development, enough so that the 18-year-old Ghanaian player has been picked by Guinea for the AFCON competition. That's cool. And he not only has been picked, but he started. He started as their left back in their 2-0 loss to Algeria. So not a great performance by the team. And based on a 2-0 loss, you wouldn't expect a fullback to have had a great rating it's not a great rating. It's a 6.6, .6, but he played all 90, had a couple of interceptions, won four out of four tackles, and committed no fouls. All in all, that's pretty okay. Club reputation rankings are in, and our five worldwide clubs, Liverpool, Man City, Arsenal, Tottenham, and Chelsea, and Man United just continental now. Interesting. Villa, Newcastle, Everton, Leeds are the others that make up that tier. Uh, the one getting into the mix and probably seeing promotion i would imagine is fulham the first national league club in the rankings is carlisle or at least based on last year i wish it would give you the automatic update to you know where it is that they are in the current year to account for promotions you can see how yeovil was actually quite high in their reputation their reputation took a fall even though they comfortably won the national league south it was a lower level, and had they been relegated? Are we looking at relegation sides being that good, that much better than everybody else, potentially? There's your mark for regional. So regional ends at Oldham Athletic, who last I saw was dominating the National League North. Cut off for one and a half stars, just below Chelmsford, the other promoted side. Uh, Dolwich Hamlet is the last one and a half star club right now and that brings us into our territory right we're, we're getting the last of the national league sides we're getting into the north and south sides now Dartford, Dartford, way down the list here they have said that just got relegated afc telford also outside of our sixth tier there's one two three three more and then starting to get a mix a real mix of seventh tier sides coming in meanwhile the last handful of sixth tier sides start to show up i'd say after these five right there's not too much left below that there's still a little bit definitely the bottom end in terms of reputation of the league until you eventually get to us now we are not last in sixth tier in terms of ranking but we are absolutely at the very bottom end of that list in fact other than radcliffe from the national league north and stratford from the national league north so there's a couple really really low reputation sides in the north 
uh, but by the time you get to the bottom end of the south sides, you know, we're about seventh lowest in reputation. We are only just slightly above the reputation that we had at the end of last season. In fact, last season, we had just crossed the mark, just gotten to that point where we had one star reputation. Here we are with slight increase, moved up four spots. That's it. So we finished fourth. We made the playoffs in the National League South, playing at a higher level than we've ever played at. And we only saw our reputation increase by incy, incy bitsy bit. That's surprising that it was such a small boost being in that higher tier for one, performing well in that higher tier for another. But we didn't necessarily take home a whole lot of wins. So let's hope that if we can convert some of those draws into wins this season, convert a few of those losses into either draws or wins this season, if we can pick up 9 or 10 more points than what we had a year ago, and the game promotion, that obvious last piece, should see our reputation take a significant jump this year, and hopefully get us high enough to hit the 1.5 star status. We're already on local rep, but that 1.5 star, it's still a ways to go to reach that. Last month witnessed the fourth highest expenditure in a month of any for the club. The previous three were all major projects, either training facility upgrades in a couple of those, and then a stadium upgrade in the one prior to that. We have not paid for the stadium upgrade that's on the way. It's still in planning at the moment. What we did have, though, that saw us spend so much money, first off, was the first tax bill hit. Last season, we had a little bit of a, a debt. We had a bit of a tax bill, and we ended up paying 382000 over the course of the year. This year, it's going to be a lot more than that. And in our very first month, we already had a $150,000 tax bill. That's going to be a monthly thing. So that's going to be a much higher added expense this year. One that we're going to want to offset. In, a, in addition to that, other claimed 510000 That almost certainly would be the board. Some sort of re remuneration payment for the board. They collected a good amount of cash. They've been holding off on selling the club, and it seems like it's been close or transferring ownership of the club. With the investment for the stadium, does that mean they're going to hang on? With the remuneration fee, does that mean they're ready to sell now that they've collected half a million dollars, which is far more than what they had had previously? Mm. In terms of valuation, hard to say. Hard to say which way that that is going to go. But that 509000 already nearly exceeded the last season's total uh, outgoing. There's definitely going to be some extra money on the way out. And as a result, even though we are sitting on a healthy $12.6 million, with the new stadium that's going to be built, and as they're in that planning phase, I do think it's time that I go ahead and cash in on one of our outstanding fees, build that cash haul a bit more, handle those taxes, handle that outgoing stuff that there's going to be this season in a much higher quantity, but also give us some more money to play with when it comes to funding the stadium. I'd rather see us build a larger stadium that's going to sustain us for longer than sit on this cash for future use. This is the kind of use that we are desperately going to need it for. This is the stadium that's going to see us through the next three to four, five seasons even. Probably not big enough for Premier League, but can definitely bring us up the ladder. Deciding which one to cash in on is one of the harder things to do because we're almost certainly leaving money on the table. Seems to be a given. The one I suppose I'll go with is Donnell Trainer. And partially just because it's closer to the relative value of the player. And it covers that short term. I mean, it's going to add 50% to our total fund. $6.75 million from Stoke for a player who is roughly $12.5 in terms of value on the low end. 
and that seems to be on par with uh, what we could and should pick up for him. So we'll go ahead and sell the claws. Board is requiring that we win the league this year, making it all the more important that we do not lose additional players because we're already down by two. Uh, in terms of the other tournaments, I'm not too worried about those. But with the new funding, instantly the board has requested that we improve payroll budget for coaches which is an idea that i love because that's always one of the constraints that made it a little bit harder to get the best available coaches is we can't pay them enough by how much always hard to say uh, until you get in and start trying to negotiate deals but that absolutely is going to help us in both retaining but also acquiring a top coaching staff as we continue to climb by the way, I didn't show it last episode, but as we were wrapping up the season, our U18s over the last few years have bego- have gotten progressively better playing against Premier League level U18s. They were still near the bottom of the table, but they weren't last. Meanwhile, the U21s, which have been a massive struggle for us playing at a similar type level and having really the weaker end of our prospects, not the guys that are closer to senior level, but the guys that are there in a pinch if we need them and available if we need them, but really are the weaker prospects comparatively to the U18s. A lot of our U18s go straight to the senior squad. And again, this year is looking no different as I've already made a few selection choices to bring up some players into the squad and generally bumping a few of those guys back down, but to the U21s back up there. Uh, But, The U21s did perform better this last year, where they had been winless every season so far since joining a league. This last year, they had three draws. Not a single win, but they had three draws. The goal differential was a lot better. They didn't lose every single game. They were still weaker. They were still inferior to the level uh, surrounding but they are making progress. First of July, it's the big swap day. So Bercielli and Sumohoro are gone. Kasango Matumbo, we had to initiate the uh, minimum security as he had signed on a free with someone else. So we've brought him back, but he does have some sort of clause that would allow them to buy him uh, for a fee. But anyway, Brody Bick, one of our previously sold players, who we still have a clause out on, has an offer of 18 and a quarter million from Huddersfield. So good chance that he is about to move on to a new club and we could be in for a roughly additional 9 million. Recently, Kitching has outpaced the development of Lanahan Penneries. They're level at 108 each, but Kitching moves to the top of the list as our best player. Atakunle also still just behind them, and then Ben Ben Hassel. It's really nice to have a center back pairing that makes it difficult on other teams to score. It was really nice to have a really good goalkeeper behind them as well. Without that, eh, we're a little worse off. But Sam Julian, the 17-year-old goalkeeper who just spent his rookie year in the U18s after graduating, he's already at 83 with a potential of 148. I don't think he's going to last long before big offers come in and we lose him to some bigger clubs, but Sam Julian, he'll be just fine. I would imagine he's going to develop pretty quickly. Should be 90 plus, maybe even by the start of the season, more likely a month or two in. Mortland, Thornhill, both on the verge of 100. Atkins, not too far from it. Davidson taking over as the main striker at just 17. Should be 95 plus by midseason. Webb as a backup is solid. And then Redknapp, McFadden, uh, their development has always been slow compared to other players. I mean, they both started in the 60s or 70s, and neither one of them is young. In fact, they're both 22. They've been with us for a long time, like Chris Webb. The development side, it's picked up a little bit. And they'll continue to grow. I'd like to see them get to 90 plus over the course of this season so that they're not just good for this level, but good enough to handle the likes of the wingers that we went up against in those top three teams last season, knowing that there's got to be something this year 
that's going to be equally challenging for us. I'd like to see those guys improve. The drop off is less severe, less pronounced than in previous seasons. Kamara's already into the 80s. Wilkinson has inched his way up into the 80s. Kasunga Matumbo, a 74. He's not going to change much. Uh, Archie Jones, rookie, coming up. I've brought him to replace uh, Arthur. Arthur down to the U21s. Archie Jones already a little bit better than Arthur and will provide us a finally a solid backup uh, given time. He's just 16. He was in that last intake and I'm looking forward to see his rapid development. I would expect to see him in the upper 80s before the end of the season. I'll try to get him some game time to help him along with that. Primus comes in as the new backup over Duncan at defensive midfield. They're actually the same age, but Primus got a lot of playing time in the U21s and developed a lot this year where Duncan didn't play a whole lot. And so Primus just overtook him as a better option, better ball recoverer, which I think for a backup defensive mid is a little more important than them being creative. Stop the other team from scoring, help us recover the ball, let the attacking players handle the creative sense. There's obviously a drop-off being a backup, being a young backup. If they can't do as much, I'd rather have them at least do their primary job, which is help us recover the ball, and then hopefully just be adequate and not turn the ball over frequently uh, offensively. Mark Walker, who we already promoted last season over Tom Evans, uh, will continue on in his role, and he's grown a little bit, now a 62. He was 50-something uh, when he took over that role, so he is making progress, but his ceiling is not too far off, so he won't grow much more. And Greg continues to be our backup goalkeeper once again because Sam Julian was the only quality option we had. Otherwise, the drop-off is severe. So hanging on to Julian for a while until we get a decent keeper once again. And that's the thing. We are losing keepers a little bit faster than we're getting quality ones coming in through the intakes. So let's hope that he is not a one and done for us and that he is, we are capable of keeping him around for at least a couple seasons to give us at least a couple intakes to find a replacement. As I mentioned before, the U21s is improving. There's a good seven players here that are better than just about anything we had in the U21s in prior seasons. Marmon Ings, a 71, is capable of contributing at the senior level. And last season, these top guys did appear at the senior level. They they got a fair number of call-ups. And it's helped them in their development, but a lot of them have a very limited ceiling. In fact, none of those top players, anyway, have potential beyond a 100. The drop-off is actually a little less severe than it was before, also. We had a lot of players in the low 30s. We're down to just two players in that below 35 threshold. And they're both backup goalkeepers. Then there's only two players in the 35 to 40 range, or less than 40 range. And again, that's a testament of the progress we are making because I was able to let go of six players who just were not cutting it, were not good enough, replace them with U18s. The reason why I was able to replace them with U18s was, well, for one thing, some of them are aging up. And so a couple of players get bumped up that way. But for the most part, I thin the U18 squad down a little bit. There's a few reserves on here. No backup goalkeeper at the U18s level. All three of those U21 keepers are too old to be down here in the U18s. But look at the quality here. I mean, we've got four guys that are 60 plus. We've got another eight or nine 50 plus. And you can see why this group does better than the U21s do. They are a very similar team. If they scrimmaged one another, this squad doesn't have a Marmon Ings, who's a 71, but it does have a lot more depth. I mean, you know, a player at 50 is way down towards the bottom end of this squad, where a player at 50 is near the top of the U21 squad. A few guys in the high 40s. And then the fall off. Just four weaker players on the roster that are in that higher end 30s. Uh, 
One of them has just turned 18, but I think he's eligible for the year. If not, uh, he'll get moved up, but there is another backup here that, you know, could play. Oop, no, he is over 18, so we'll, uh, we'll bump up eight, him to the U21s and move Chan into that position. He's only just aged up here the last couple weeks. I think the cutoff day was today, so everybody else should be eligible to play in the U18s for the year. So that's really just, what, three backups beyond the full squad. So not much if there's injuries, but that also assures a lot of playing time. And then in those U21s, a little more depth, a little more room for, hey, maybe we could loan somebody out, or hey, if something happens at the senior level, we've got some backups. Because at the senior level, we also only have just a few backups. Right now, I have three beyond our limitation of five on the match day squad. That's, of course, set for some preseason preparation. But we're definitely showing the signs of being a squad, a growing ability, growing depth. The bottom end has been just about eliminated now. Just a year ago, just two years ago, we were still relying on nearly half a dozen players that were in the mid-40s of current ability as our backups. They weren't our starters. I mean, Greg had to serve as starter for a little bit, but outside of him, they, they weren't our starters. But through injuries or just whatever necessity, they came off the bench a lot. They played a lot more than you would want them to. And now we're not only not looking at that prospect, but we're not looking at players in the 50s either. We're looking at 60s plus. So I, I definitely like the direction we're headed. We have more players that are 100 current ability or better than we've ever had. We had one little stretch where we had a few guys that had topped that and we were coming along and then we lost five, six players in the same offseason. Let's just hope that this is not that year. Well, that's disappointing when that happens, but it happens. It's a regular part. Uh, the deal for Brody Bick has gone through the $18.25 million from Hull to Huddersfield. But Hull was not his first destination after leaving us. It was Burnley. So we had already cashed in on him prior. He was one of the ones that brought us some money previously. This being the second deal gives us significantly less. And actually, this one even had a deal on it. He, it was a release clause that was triggered, by the way. So he didn't, the club didn't have much choice. It wouldn't go for any more. It was what it was. Burnley gets 700k, 30% of the profit, and meanwhile we get half of that. We get 350,000 because we had the 50% sell-on clause, so it's not nothing. 350,000 is 350,000. That's a lot of money. It could have been a whole lot more, right? Could have been 9 million, but 350k it is. A little bit more in the bank. Mid-July, so it's only been two weeks since leaving us, but Sumohoro Scatter report coming back on him, and it comes back that he's a good Skybet League One talent already. So our top end, because Sumohoro was right there near our top end, our guys who are a little over a 100, seem to be League One equivalent. Looking at our own player, Dan Kitching, the one getting a lot of attention right now, and the guy at the top of our list says close to full potential, but it says good Skybet League One player. So we do have players that are well above our level right this is i mean th this is like Wrexham squad type thing how it is that we didn't cruise the, through the league last year is a little bit of a mystery i mean it looks like we should be better than we were just a reminder we did have a lot of injuries last year at two different phases of the season we also had a couple players who went through a two-month stretch of heavy attention from bigger clubs wanting to buy them off of us and them being very upset so we had morale issues we had injury issues we should have been better but the top three teams in the league we did have a difficult time with so it's it's going to be interesting to see what the league looks like this year when i talked to the team about winning the league they seemed pretty inclined to to do that the club also feels like we should be winning the league and that was not the case last year so maybe maybe we're in a better state 
to to challenge and actually do that this season. But again, it's only mid July. We still have a month and a half and plenty of time to potentially lose players, and there's tons of offers out there. But the big thing about that one, if they do start offering enough money and we are losing players with that minimum security a piece of that, I can in good faith negotiate that not only do we get that 50% sell on clause, which is such a valuable resource for us to build a new stadium, upgrade training facilities, so on and so forth. But it's also entirely possible for us to get loan backs for the year to keep those players for this season and lose them at the end of the year. So there's no reason to believe that the team's going to be any worse than it is right this moment. And if we're good enough to win the league right this moment, we should be able to remain that way. It's just how many players are we going to lose at the end of the year kind of territory. Late July now, so we've still got a little bit of time before the season starts, but not much. And the early preseason odds, promotion odds, do have us as favorites. 3-10, Three to ten, or title odds evens. We're, we're looking like the team. Bromley, looking like second best. Real Bedford, showing up. So Real Bedford, uh, if memory serves me correctly, and it may not. Real Bedford is the team that was along the same path as us. They turned professional way early, and that professionalism, and along with the ability to spend some money saw them cruising through in a way that even we weren't cruising. And the very first time that we didn't win a title, it was them. They were the ones who won it. And they promoted. We took second. We beat them the year before, I think only just. But we were the side-by-side promotion teams. Now, they are from a similar region to us. Not right next door, but we're both from that southwest peninsula and for them they ended up in the north division but it looks like they didn't get promoted and with the realignment of teams going down teams going up they this time properly find themselves in the southern division and picked third for going up porky fourth lose gloucester only sixth Surprising on that one, maybe they punched above their weight, but I mean, they were tough for us. But it's the same teams near the top, other than the addition of Real Bedford. So that suggests that the relegated teams are not appearing to be a big threat. We're looking at a very similar league, and we continue to grow, and we're already coming in as favorites. So I'm liking how things are shaping up at the moment for the coming season. I mean, Weymouth is all the way down in 11th. Uh, in terms of odds on favorites, Eastbourne, Burrow, Worthing, Chatham, Hazen Yetting, 101, 100 to 1 or worse, and picked for uh, going down. But Gosport down at 18th. Weymouth at 11th, you know, suggests that there's a couple teams that either punched above their weight last year or got worse somehow. On the road for the season opener. Havant and Waterlooville is the opponent. The bench looks a little bit different. First 11, almost the same. Two changes, and that's our two lone backs from last season finally gone. Bertielli, no longer with the club. Sumahoro, no longer with the club. Davidson, of course, got the starts during the playoff phase and started a lot of games as it was. Julian, meanwhile was our just over a year ago intake player who was down in the U18s developing well, playing nicely, and he inherits the goalkeeping position as a pretty talented player already, but we'll see how he performs in these early matches. Will he A, develop quickly, and last season suggests that he will, uh, but B, will he get off to a good start? Or will he be mistake prone? Bertielli was mistake prone when he started out, really. Oh, come on. And we start trailing early on. Are you kidding me? This is one of the weaker teams in the league. Big first touch from Spencer. That should have been cut out by Redknapp in the first place. 
And then he lays it off for Trevitt, who goes unmarked and puts in a monster goal. I mean, there's nothing Julian can do there. That's not on him. Bercielli, I don't think he's going to save that one either. 0 .04 XG. And we trail. Kitching still around for now. The offers have dried up a little bit. The early summer season, people who wanted to get deals done early, lots and lots of offers came in. When I wasn't having any of it, a lot of teams backed off and lost interest. And there you go. David said gets his first of the season. And we're level. That's important for him taking over the role. He scored 10 goals last season. He played either backing up Lanahan Penrees or in place of Sumohoro quite a few times. Thornhill might have gotten a touch there. I don't know if he's going to be credited with an assist or whether that was the defense who deflected that one. I think it may have been Thornhill. It does look like it took a minor deflection. But anyway. So Davidson played on top a bit. Uh, this season though, obviously he is set to be the guy on top. And he's not on Sumohoro's level, but not ter terribly far behind. And we come so close to getting a go-ahead. Oh, it's a penalty. I didn't see that it was called a penalty. And I saw the kind of the trip up. But Lanahan Penrice converts. It's 2-1. And we are quickly on top after trailing early on in this one in just about 10 minutes. Bell. Yeah, can't understand what he was doing there. Not quite flat-footed. It looks like he stepped to his left and the ball went just over his right shoulder. But he was just dumbfounded as to how awkward he was to react to that. Ooh, big chance. Julian steps up big, punches it away. Big giveaway. No problem there. Five for six, already two XG. Of course, a penalty gives you a lot of XG, but we've got a large amount here early on and we are definitely playing well at the moment Moreland through for Thornhill and it's three he is on side it was well timed Thornhill doing un, un Thornhill like things he's easily on side there so after trailing early in this one we bounce back very quickly with a couple of goals to take the lead and then continue to put the pressure on by grabbing a third before halftime. Big dangerous moment here and Julian steps up to the challenge, makes the save. Not only that, he doesn't recycle it right in front of goal for them to possibly get on the end of. He's able to put it out for the corner kick. Was that heading off of us? I guess it was the way we chased that down. They've had six attempts to our seven, but we've had 71% possession. We've had six on target to their two. 2.3 in the XG to just 0.5 for them. In fact, they just had two shots back-to-back -back that we didn't see that added to that. Mortland on a yellow, and we've got to start thinking about what sort of subs we want to make here to see out the final minutes. I'm going to wait about five more minutes at this stage. Oh, bad giveaway from Hassel. Beachy cuts the gap in half. That is a terrible play from Hassel. It's a really, really poor pass. Atkins, absolutely nothing he can do to get on the end of that one. And then from Hassel, again, makes a second mistake on here. Perfectly placed shot from Beachy. Uh, Julian, well positioned, but nothing he can do. And now all of a sudden we're sitting on just a one goal lead. Akunle is struggling a little bit. Uh, let's go ahead and bring on Kasanga Matumbo. We've got Archie Jones ready to make his debut, and we might just do that here with Lanahan. Pin Reese for the final minutes, get some fresh legs on, and get Archie Jones out there. A little nervous about. Oh my goodness, what a reaction from Julian. That took a deflection. He was going the wrong way. Let's get into the time wasting and the set pieces and go balanced. Being on the front foot. Really, oh my gosh, another bad giveaway from the defense unable to possess the ball this is worse than anything we've seen is this an fm24 kind of new tactics or is it first game of the season nerves from our center backs unable to complete passes that ball for jones also left wanting 
And we turn it over. McFadden recovers. Mortland finds Jones. Thornhill finds Davidson. Possessing well at the moment. Now McFadden providing that width for us. Now inside for Thornhill and Jones. Big save there. Caper pushes that one wide. Corner kick. Time wasting. Going full force. Pushing us into stoppage and Hassel converts. Was he onside? He steps through. It looks like he might have been. Uh, it was off the tight here. We'll see when it's played. There's a guy on the post. He's, oh yeah, no, we're easily good. There was a guy on the near post and the guy took half a step. It was all he got away from the post by the time that pass came in. So it's converted, it's 4-2. And we should now easily see this thing out in the final seconds. Jones gets his debut, but it was late enough that uh, not having much impact, but it'll help him with the nerves of future competition. I think I had somebody else called up too, but he was not on the bench today. I was comfortable. The goals were deserved. We've we got a lot on target. They pumped in a few shots late, but they, they were long range. They weren't impacting anything, and they weren't on target either. Defense came up a little short on the first day of the season, but they were good finishes, both of them. Got to give them credit where credit is due. We played well otherwise. We didn't give up much. It was all long-range stuff. We had a lot of possession. The bad giveaway, a concern. Two defensive errors, two bad giveaways. That's it. But other than that, really good performance to start the season. We are favorites. Let's hope that we can hang on to players. Let's hope that we can keep morale high and not have too many guys upset over transfer dealings. Kitching's already gotten over the offers that he had, but he still wanted, so there will be more, and he's probably going to get upset again. Right now we're down to just one player who's suffering from the I-want-to-leave bug. That's going to do it for this episode, though. I'm the Cathalon Gamer. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one. Be safe out there. Bye for now.